First of all, a little bit about this title, Capitalism versus Christianity, A Tale of Two Cults. Since cult tends to be a pejorative term, you know, after all, nobody calls home and says, good news, I've joined a cult. <laughs> Doesn't tend to be the way we use the term. Uh, it would not be surprising if both capitalists and Christians took issue with the title. So let me begin by defining cult in the least pejorative way I can think of. When I speak of a cult today, I mean a group organized around a distinctive set of non-rational beliefs that cult members assert to be true beyond question, even when the evidence for those beliefs is thin or non-existent. Now that's a, an expansive definition of a cult going well beyond either how scholars or the general public tends to use the term. And I'm offering it not really for precision, but as a precaution. That definition of cult reminds us all to be critically self-reflective about what we believe. Uh, defined this way, we can take a term that's usually deployed to describe groups that are thought of as either dangerous or crazy or a little both. And I think it can help us understand the problems of living in a capitalist culture and the possibilities of living in a Christian one. Now, before going forward, let me be clear that I recognize there are non-rational aspects of my own beliefs, just as there is such a component to every belief system. Even the most scientific of scientists would have to acknowledge that at least if they take seriously neuroscience, psychology, and common sense. That is to say, human beings are not calculating machines, but instead we are complex biological entities, and what little we know about human consciousness, we don't know that much, suggests that we're just as skilled at fooling not only ourselves, but fooling others and that we need to take that seriously. If we have time, we can talk a little bit more about what psychologists call motivated reasoning and what we know about how we all think. But even acknowledging that we can't reduce life to purely rational claims, that all of us are this complex mix of reason and emotion, of hard data and abstract theory, of the rational and the non-rational, the sane and the crazy, the conscious and the unconscious, even with that recognition, it doesn't mean we shouldn't be honing our capacity to analyze the world rationally and subjecting both secular and theological systems to critique. The fact that we aren't able to understand all of reality doesn't mean reality doesn't constrain our thinking. Now, so far all of this may sound like I'm playing to a Unitarian crowd, right? This is the way Unitarians tend to see the world. But don't get too cocky because I'm coming after you as well. <laughs> if you are a Unitarian, be assured you will be a target of today's talk, especially of whatever jokes. Why not start with a joke, yes? So many Unitarian jokes, so little time. <laughs> Every time I speak here, I feel compelled to offer one of them. Here's, one, here's another of my favorites. Why did the Unitarian cross the road? to support the chicken in its search for its own path. <laughs> and we're gonna come back, if there's time at the end, I'll come back to why I think that's appropriate to our discussion today. All right, if that seemed like a cheap shot, it was. It's the first of many, so just strap in. But knowing Unitarians, you look forward to those cheap shots. It makes you feel uh, even more self-confident. <laughs> Don't let the well-known Unitarian ability to laugh at yourselves lead to any cocky self-assurance of your own. All right, let me start with a clear statement on my own position on these two cults I'm speaking of. First of all, I am anti-capitalist without hesitation. Capitalism is based on a pathological claim about human nature and a logic that is fundamentally unsustainable ecologically. In other words, I'm, I'm anti-capitalist because I don't believe what capitalism says about you and me, 
and I don't accept what it does to the larger living world. I am anti-capitalist because capitalism, while it is practiced in various ways across time and place, is based on a principle that I can see no way to rescue or rehabilitate and has consequences that I cannot accept. I am Christian with many hesitations. Christianity, we should remember, like every other religious tradition, is just that. It's a tradition. It's not a clear set of principles. There is not, never has been, and never will be a single Christianity. What there is is a constant struggle for what it means to claim to be Christian. And I am a Christian with these many hesitations because I think within that widely varied tradition are ideas about people and our place in that larger living world that I think offer us a chance to step back from the edge of the cliff that we seem to be hurtling toward and at this point seem hell-bent on jumping off. So, in the sense of the way I'm using this term cult, what I'm really arguing is that capitalism can never be anything but a cult. But that Christianity and its tradition is open to reinterpretation and it's possible to be to move Christianity beyond cultishness. Which, of course, is counterintuitive since many think capitalism is a completely rational enterprise and that Christianity is some kind of crazy. I'm arguing the opposite, that in fact, a commitment to Christianity can be rational and that capitalism is not only, not only a cult, but essentially at this point, quite clearly, a kind of death cult. Now, before I go forward to try and justify that claim, just a note on the relevance of these two systems I'm talking. First of all, the question of capitalism is global. It has to be dealt with by everybody everywhere. Right? Everyone has to come to terms with that system since that system defines virtually all of the world's economy. The question of Christianity is more local. I want to come to terms with Christianity because it so happens I was born into a Christian culture. I realize people don't like that. You know, so, well, this isn't a Christian nation. This isn't a Christian country by law. I agree with that. But it is, in fact, culturally Christian. Um, if I were in Pakistan, I would be exploring these ideas through Islam. If I was in India, I would be doing it through Hinduism. There are local traditions everywhere that we can use to try and make sense of the world. So although I'm going to talk exclusively about the Christian tradition today, I am not an exclusively Christian person in that sense. All right. So I'm going to talk first about two problems of capitalism. I hinted at them earlier. One is the moral claim on which capitalism is based. The second is its inherent logic. The moral claim that capitalism makes. We have to remember that capitalism, while a profoundly amoral system in practice, is based on a moral claim of sorts. It says something like this, that human beings are greedy, self-interested animals, and if you want to shape an economy that will work, you have to shape that economy with that understanding that you have to reward greed and self-interest. And that by doing that, you'll create an economy that serves everybody. That's the claim that capitalists make, right? That there is no other option, that greed is the dominant component of human nature. So let's be rational for a minute about that claim. If I were to survey this group, it looked like a fairly representative sample of humanity. Uh, how many of you have ever acted in a way that was greedy or self-interested? I'm not going to go on until you raise your hand, sir. No. We have an alleged saint in the room. Just walk on by that one. All right. How many of you have ever acted in a way that was rooted in compassion and caring, solidarity, which you took risks that had no benefit for yourself, maybe even extreme risks. 
Well, at least he's consistent. He's not raising his hand for that one either. <laughs> All right. So what do we know about human nature? Well, a minute reflection tells us that human nature is widely varying and pretty plastic. It's malleable that all of us probably have within us the capacity to be selfless and understand how to sacrifice for others, and we all probably have the capacity to be torturers. That's human nature. We don't, don't know much about it beyond that. Capitalism's claim is that that greed and self-interest is the dominant component of human nature. It's what defines us. The question is, is that an, a rational claim? Well, only if you accept the kind of circular logic of capitalism, which is something like this. Look around you. People are acting in greedy and self-interested ways all the time. Therefore, greed and self-interest is the dominant component of human nature. That argument essentially says, if you create a system that rewards greed and self-interest, people will act in greedy and self-interested ways, which is true enough. You create a system that rewards that, and that's how people behave. That says nothing about what is the dominant component of human nature in some more expansive way. And in fact, if you think about human history, greed and self-interest for virtually all of human history were not the dominant components of our nature. If you go back to what we tend to call prehistory, right, which we tend to ignore because it's convenient to ignore it, for most of human history, Every human on the planet lived in a gathering and hunting band, probably no more than 50, 100, tops 150 people, in which cooperation defined one's relationship to others, not competition. Greed and self-interest were not the defining characteristics. It doesn't mean we need to romanticize gathering and hunting people. They had the same capacity for violence and nastiness as we do, but that wasn't the dominant component of human nature. So capitalism's claim that you must construct the economy this way to take account of the dominant component of human nature is quite simply silly. It's not a serious claim. It's certainly not rational. It's an ideological claim and one we can dispense with quite quickly. All right, so there's a claim about human nature. There's also a claim that's very relevant to our concern with nature, with that larger living world. Capitalism is a system based on a, an idea of unlimited growth. Unlimited growth on a finite planet. Another ideological claim of capitalism is that this growth can and will go on forever. That as we bump up against the limits, let's say, of one resource, the principle of kind of infinite substitutability will kick in and we'll devise a replacement for that and on we will go. That notion of the possibility of unlimited growth was possible to believe for a while, but is increasingly impossible to believe as we look at the consequences across the board of capitalism, of a system based on endless and unlimited growth. And here it's important not just to focus on climate change, although climate change, of course, is a crucial question, but to look across the board at every indicator of the health of the ecosphere that makes our own existence possible. There's a lot of data on the health of the ecosphere and specific ecosystems. If you look across the board, I think it's fair to summarize by saying the news is bad and it's getting worse. That while there have been successful efforts in specific places to, you know, let's say, clean up a river or improve the air quality, there have been public policies used to locally improve ecological conditions through things like the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act in the United States. That if you look across the board on things like topsoil loss or groundwater availability and quality, right, and importantly, the question of species extinction and biodiversity, you look across the board and the news is pretty grim. And the idea that we can continue with this logic of unlimited growth, it seems to me also is not rational at all and is, fact, is in fact simply an ideological claim. 
Now, the capitalist ideologues have the upper hand these days for not surprising reasons, given the resources at their disposal. But it seems to me that the, the scam that contemporary capitalism is running on us is roughly equivalent to a tent revival preacher's claim to be able to heal the lame, cure the sick, and that it's a profoundly irrational act to accept the claims that capitalism makes. So, the cult of capitalism is nothing but a cult and will never be anything but a cult. It's based on the acceptance of distinctly non-rational claims, both about who we are and the nature of the world in which we live. Right. But what about Christianity? Why do I have faith in Christianity? Well, as I said, you have to first of all define what you mean by Christianity since there is no single Christian tradition and never has been. That is to say that from the beginning, Christianity was a struggle for how to understand the claims made by those early followers. And there is, always has been and always will be, a, a strain of thinking within Christianity that is not based on supernatural claims. It doesn't take seriously or literally the idea that God is a force or entity actually directing the world, or that the resurrection was a literal historical fact. There's always been a, a strain of Christianity that takes the text and the tradition as myth, symbol, poetry, as a place where wisdom resides, along with a fair amount of craziness as well, and that the struggle for Christians at any given moment in history is to work with that tradition. That's the kind of Christian I am. That's the dominant view of Christianity in the church I belong to, St. Andrew's Presbyterian here in Austin. And it's a view of Christianity I realize is not the majority view at this point in US history, which is why the Presbyterian denomination on a fairly regular basis tries to kick some or all of us out of the church. But we're still struggling there, <laughs> fighting the good fight. And I continue to do that because the longer I work with that tradition, with the myth, symbol, and poetry of the tradition, the more I see that wisdom. Today I want to talk about two of those stories that typically are not thought of when we talk about rationality, but I think are increasingly important. One is original sin, and the other is the notion of the apocalyptic. Not two subjects that tend to lead to rational discourse. Yes, we know that these have troubled histories. For the women in the room, the notion of original sin, how it got tacked on to Eve. Okay, I, these concepts have a troubled past, I'm recognizing. But we're trying to work with them. So why do I find two notions that are typically connected to the most regressive, reactionary, or just plain loony strains of Christianity. What do I find of value in talking about original sin and the notion of the apocalyptic? Well, original sin, let's go back to the story, the story of the garden. Even if you're not Christian or Jewish, you probably know the story. It's hard to get away from it in this culture. But there you've got Adam and Eve, and everything's looking good in the garden. There's the tree of life, and the tree of life provides all that they need. But you know the story, along comes Satan, there is temptation, and they eat from the fruit of what's often called the tree of knowledge. But it's, remember, not just the tree of knowledge, it's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And I think it's appropriate to see that as symbolic. The, the eating of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is, I think, the way we mark when human beings started to believe that they were God. Right, that human beings could intervene in this larger living world and control the consequences of that intervention. So the original sin, it seems to me, is human beings losing our place in the world. You know, whether, whatever the word God means to you, and might not mean anything, but whatever 
people use it to mean, the one thing that almost everybody agrees on is whatever God is, we aren't it. <laughs> and that's a good thing to keep in mind, especially in a culture where human beings act as if they have God-like capacities and God-like prescience. So you can look at the story of the garden and the fall and see it as an allegory about agriculture, about that moment when human beings left gathering and hunting and began the intervention into biological processes that it turned out we couldn't control. It sort of reframes the story of civilization. We usually think of the invention of agriculture, the domestication of animals, as the moment when civilization began and became possible. It probably is better understood as the point where we started to go off the rails. Jared Diamond, the author, once called it the greatest mistake in human history. That agriculture is where we begin drawing down the ecological capital of the planet at beyond replacement levels a process that went on quite slowly for thousands of years and then was ratcheted up in the industrial era with the fossil fuel epoch and now leaves us on the precipice of a world that likely cannot continue to sustain large-scale human populations in the way that we understand that into the indefinite future. So that notion of original sin turns out to have some value in reminding us that the problem we face today is not that we are not smart enough, but that we think we're way smarter than we really are. That we are a clever species and we can intervene in that world, but our capacity to control the consequences of that intervention is considerably limited. And because of that, I've grown increasingly fond of the notion of the apocalyptic. Again, not in the way it's traditionally deployed by Christians. I'm not going to lapse into some rapture-ready talk here about whether or not you've been saved, brothers and sisters. I'm in a Unitarian church. None of you have been saved. I know that. You're, you're hopeless. So if we, when we invoke the apocalyptic, when we talk about the book of Revelation, looking at it not as a blueprint for the future, but as myth poetry, symbolism, we can again see the value of that particular story. Remember that apocalypse, which is the Greek and revelation is the Latin, they both mean the same thing. They don't mean the end of the world. They've come to mean that in popular culture, but the terms mean a coming to clarity, a lifting of the veil, an ability to see clearly, which is, I think, what we need. The apocalyptic also suggests that we are at the end of something, not the end of the world, not some rivers of blood, lakes of fire. I mean, I, it's not about that. It's about the end of systems. The systems that now govern the world are not going to continue indefinitely. And we can start to think about what's on the other side of the systems that we currently live in. So. The strengths of Christianity are that these stories, which resonate with so many of us, whether we're out of the Christian tradition or not, they're part of the cultural stock, these stories. And they're very useful at reshaping our understanding of where we sit in this world, who we are as people, and what we're doing to that larger living world. So that's why I say I, I am anti-capitalist and would argue that anyone who holds on to capitalism is cultish and why Christianity, while often embraced in very cultish ways, offers us actually a, a way to understand ourselves in the world that's quite compelling. So I assume that there's a variety of people in the room with a variety of positions, so let me sort of sum up by um, some categories and some recommendations. Let's say that there are two kinds of capitalists. If 
you're not quite ready to identify as anti-capitalist, there are two kinds. True believer capitalists, the ones who not only see no other option, but see no reason to explore other options. The market fundamentalists, the, neoliber the neoliberals, the libertarians, the Ayn Randians, all sorts of different variations of true believer capitalists who embrace the non-rational system and celebrate it. If you're in that court category, I suggest you rethink that idea. But there's also a lot of reluctant capitalists. A lot of people who say, well, we see the problems here, but there is simply no other option. That's understandable. The great battle of the 20th century between some version of socialism and capitalism between capitalism and communism framed in all sorts of different ways, that battle is over and that state-planned socialist model has been happily, you know, relegated to the dustbin of history appropriately so. But that doesn't mean that capitalism wins by default. And we're at a moment that's actually not only rather scary, but rather exciting because it's those moments where we get to imagine new possibilities. So if you're a true believer capitalist, my argument is quite clear, but if you're a reluctant capitalist, I understand, but being reluctantly accepting of capitalism doesn't mean you have to be silent. And in fact, when people have doubts but are silent, they are no better than the true believers in my perspective. Same thing can be said about Christianity. There are true believer Christians, those who focus on doctrine and belief and who assert that to be Christian you have to accept this specific set of doctrines and believe. And obviously, I'm not arguing for that perspective. And then there are the conflicted Christians, I suppose the category that I'm in, who want to shift the focus away from doctrine and belief to values and practices. And there, the same rule applies. If you're conflicted but silent, you're no better than the true believer, so it's important to speak up. I want to go back to the Unitarian joke. Why did the Unitarian cross the road to help the chicken find its own path? I would like to suggest that we banish the phrase, your own path, from our vocabulary from now on. You don't have a right to your own path. There is no individual path. The whole obsession with finding your own path is a, an outgrowth of a consumer culture, of a capitalist culture, of an obsession with the individual. None of us are on our own path. The whole idea is, in fact, ludicrous. We are social beings. Our paths are always collective, never individual. And this obsession with finding our own path, I think, is counterproductive. That's never been more important, because if we all find our own path, all we're doing typically is accelerating the speed at which we approach the catastrophic. So the question isn't how do we find our own path. The question is how do we understand what kind of path for us, collectively, has the possibility of creating a world not Define, in which humans are defined as nothing but greed and self-interest, in which we create a world that is not dependent on the notion of unlimited growth, but starts to reformulate what it means to live a good life, which is, of course, the question we always return to. What is a good life and how do we lead it? And on that, I thought I'd better end on an endorsement of the Unitarian tradition, yes? Because the Unitarian tradition has always taken seriously that notion. What is the good life? What does it mean to live a good life? Recognizing that the answer to that question, never settled, never certain, but the answer to that question does reside in the great wisdom traditions of the human species and that sensible people would draw on them all. 
your, your point is well taken. What, how, how does this greed manifest ourselves? First of all, everybody's had the personal experience of acting in a way that was self-interested and might have caused harm to others. If you can't reflect on your own life and identify such places, then you're not being honest. But you're also pointing out that vir just by virtue of participating in an economy based on these values, we all are acting greedily, whether we like it or not. So my retirement fund is invested in all sorts of ways that are hardly consistent with decent human values and hardly consistent with the construction of decent human communities. And in that sense, it's important to remember that everybody's implicated in it. Right? But that's been true of lots of systems throughout human history. People are born and live where they live in that time. And it's not a question of self-righteously transcending where you live. It's a question of struggling to make where you live work better. So yes, in that sense, most of us who have money invested in the markets, which is probably a big chunk of us, are greedy every second of every day. Yeah. So it's hard to have hope that we can remove the oligarchs. Uh, that's only one of the many things you should be worried about. Okay, so so um, yes, this question of hope. I'm not big on hope. I think hope is actually an impediment to an honest evaluation of the world and reasonable strategy. So whenever people are preaching hope, I'm always snarling. I think hope is a bad thing at this point. Uh, I once gave a talk called, Hope is for the Lazy and the Weak. Right? Uh, I don't think there is any hope in that sense for, if by hope we mean that in a reasonable time frame we can intervene in the systems that currently structure the world and create a world that somehow can continue in something like the way we're used to life going on. I don't think that's possible. I think we need to be thinking about what's on the other side. And in that case, uh, one impediment is the oligarchs. That is the incredibly concentrated wealth which is now being used in some ways that are not new, but some ways that are quite creatively new to control the political system. So we're struggling with the reality that economic and political systems don't work in separate spheres, that in a world of concentrated wealth, the principle of equality in, equality in decision making is virtually unattainable. Uh, that in fact, as even some mainstream political scientists are starting to say, we live in a democracy in name only and probably should stop using or asking the question, are we a democracy or not? I encourage my students not to ask, is the United States or any other society a democracy? But to ask, to what degree is a society democratic? And if we define democracy as a system in which ordinary people have a meaningful role in the formation of public policy, which is actually quite a radical definition of democracy, if you think about it, ordinary people have a meaningful role in the formation of public policy. That is, ordinary people participating not merely by voting for one or another set of relatively elite proposals, but actually having a role in forming public policy. The United States is far from a functioning democracy. We are not very democratic. That's a problem. But the other problem, and in some ways the more far-reaching problem, is that we live in a high energy, high technology society that has put in motion, I think, ecological realities that may be beyond the point of no return. And that's not just a problem of the 1%. The 1% contribute to that problem in a disproportionate fashion. But we are trapped in a world that is fundamentally unsustainable. That high energy, high technology societies now clearly, I think, cannot continue. The only way you can believe that this high energy, high technology game can, can go on is by um, a kind of fundamentalism that some of us think is the worst fundamentalism, the technological fundamentalism. The belief that whatever problems we have that are the result of a high energy, high technology society can be solved by more technology. That's kind of the ultimate fundamentalism. 
you gave me a choice between having to hang out with technological fundamentalists and religious fundamentalists. I take the religious people all the time. If you're sitting around the Thanksgiving Day table and you're challenged to come up with an alternative to capitalism, what do you say? Well, first of all, just a quick note, since we are coming up on the holiday commonly known as Thanksgiving, or what some of us call Genocide Denial Day. <laughs> My first recommendation is don't go to a Thanksgiving Day dinner. I boycott them myself. It's one of the many reasons I'm very popular. Um, of course, this is boycott now that I think about it in kind of a theoretical sense, because to boycott something, you must be invited into it. <laughs> so I boycott many things that, of course, I'm never invited into. Um, so what about this question? It's a reasonable question. What about alternatives? Well, first of all, it's important to recognize that capitalism is a very recent phenomenon. It has not defined all of human existence. It's a, depending on how you chart it, a couple hundred, 250 years old, people offer different dates for the beginning of capitalism. We're talking about a blip in human history, and even more of a blip in the history of the planet. Capitalism is not the only way people have ever organized the production, distribution, and consumption of goods and services. That's the first thing. So this notion that it's inevitable or immutable is just kind of silly. Right? Now, if somebody asked me to devise an alternative system, and I pulled off the shelf a book that had a system all designed and ready to be implemented, the first thing you should do is assume I'm a lunatic because no one has the capacity in a world this complex to devise such a system. I think that at this point, what we can say without hesitation is that we have values and principles. Right? And those values and principles are not hard to identify because they're not only the values and principles of the political left, but of most human beings on the planet now, and most every philosophical and theological system. Notions about the inherent dignity of all people, which is now commonly accepted, if not acted upon. The notion that there has to be some sort of rough equality for decent human communities to endure. And the idea of solidarity, that we are, in fact, not individuals in any meaningful sense, that we only exist in collaboration and connection. Well, dignity, equality, solidarity, right? those are principles that you can see capitalism undermines. And the only reason that we're still alive is because other values in other systems have buffeted us against the horrors of capitalism. And if, in a sense, capitalism simply cannibalizes other value systems. And that's the only reason it hasn't destroyed the world. Right, well, we know those values, and we can experiment with how to put them into place. You mentioned worker cooperatives. That's a project I've been involved with here in Austin. We have a group called Cooperation Texas, which helps people with the support and training to start worker-owned, worker-run businesses, businesses that are democratically organized, where people run their own affairs, and that experience can be extremely profound. Those businesses, there's a few of them starting in Texas, but many more of them around the country and around the world organized the U.S. Federation of Worker Cooperatives. Many people have heard the story of the Mondragon Collective Cooperatives in Spain and the Basque region that have been amazingly successful, scaled up, not just to small-scale cooperatives, but large-scale, even industrial cooperatives. So, there's all sorts of places where you can see people experimenting with alternatives. That doesn't provide an overarching answer to the question, but it provides places where people figure out how to do it differently, how to do it better, and out of those experiments then come new ideas. The problem with that, of course, is that we're running out of time. And, and so I don't want to be naive and say, well, if we all just dig in and support worker cooperatives, eventually we'll get to the other side. But this is part of the reason I think hope is so overrated. You know? At some point, hope is just an irrational expression of denial. We have to be serious about what we're up against and commit to the projects that can help us move forward. But I don't see the point of having illusions that those projects are going to sort of take us all the way home quickly. Is it possible to have limited growth in a sustainable way? Or limits on growth. Limits on growth, yeah. Well, here again, you know, it's, there's a lot to deal with. Uh, population, I mean, I can devise all sorts of policies that would solve the problems overnight if 
people would just grant me full executive authority. Right? First thing I would do is involuntarily sterilize all of the North American middle class, which would dramatically decrease consumption and improve the world in all sorts of ways. Uh, put me out of a job in a generation as a teacher, but that's okay. Right? Uh, I don't, think, I don't think we know what's possible. Uh, is, I'm, at, I'm at a loss, in a sense, to answer the question because I'm not sure I understand where the question is, is heading. We know that the current level of consumption, not only of the most affluent, but virtually all of the developed world, is unsustainable. What level of consumption is sustainable for what number of human beings on the planet is unknown. Some people have offered that, at best, we're looking at a world that will stabilize at one or two billion. Uh, I'm not a demographer, and I haven't attempted to run the numbers. And in a sense, I don't really care, because I don't think it's a very relevant question. What I do know is that the way we live with this many people on the planet will not work, which means that the first step is to change the way we live because the number of people on the planet, there's a kind of biological imperative to reproduction that I'm not yet prepared to offer public policies to intervene in. Uh, but we can think about the way we live, and that's where I think we need to start. So this whole question of development on a global scale, well, there are some things we know which is that the reason some parts of the world are developed, as we tend to use the term, and the reasons some parts aren't, is because of the uh, large-scale barbarism of Europeans and their offshoots, for, to a large degree, Europe and eventually the United States. That the reason the world looks the way it does when you uh, evaluate the distribution of resources is because we live in the most barbaric culture in the history of the world. We, meaning those of us who identify as European and the United States. Right? That incredible levels of violence unknown prior to the barbarism of Europeans uh, is really why the world looks the way it does today. 500 years of barbarism. Notice how I've been saying barbarism over and over again, because that's the most important thing for us to understand. We are the most barbaric people in the history of the world. The, the number of bodies piled up directly attributable to Europeans and North Americans is stunning and outstrips anything from any other period of history. So that's why the world looks the way it does. So what's the solution to the development problem? Well, we know that the United States, in particular post-World II, wanted the third world to develop economically in ways that served the United States and its allies. So Traditional notions of development, like encouraging, for instance, the global south to move away from sustainable food production to commodity agriculture, right, to develop, was not in the interests of those societies. We know all of these things. Right? So what's third world development going to look like? Well, the first step in making sure it's positive is the, always the first step in conditions of imperialism, which is you get the boot of the imperial master off your neck so that options that are from below can emerge. So the first step in you know, sustainable global development is to constantly resist and reject US and related domination of the world, which still goes on under what we call post-colonial conditions. It's not the same system as the old empires, but still all the same. Here, uh, I have limited understanding expertise. Many other people, some of whom are in the room, have much greater expertise. Uh, for instance, I would recommend the work of Raj Patel, who is an important uh, activist and scholar on the question of global development, especially in the, in the area of agriculture. How to critique the previous uh, first world attempts through what we tend to call the Green Revolution to control development in the third world and in fact unleash the power of people in the third world to control their own fate. Raj's book Stuffed and Starved is a good place to start and his current project Generation Food is collecting 
stories from around the world about how that actually can work. So there are hopeful, if I dare use the term, hopeful stories around the planet of societies taking their own destiny under their own control in sometimes limited ways, but also in ways that are challenging the global north. We've seen that throughout Latin America over the last decade or two. What had once been the region most controlled by the United States has broken free in many ways all over Central and South America and some inspiring stories there as well. So global development depends on restraining us and freeing people at those levels to chart their own fate, I think. Okay, so this question about in the world we live in, where do we invest if we have resources, if we have a, rep a retirement fund, if we have a pension, where should that money go? Well, there's lots of different terms for this, socially responsible investing, green investing, all sorts of things. There's nothing wrong with those projects as long as one doesn't take them to be a substitute for more meaningful action. So I don't fuss with it much myself. I'm not terribly convinced that it matters all that much, but I don't run down people who want to research green investments or something like that. It's fine. I mean, everybody has a limited amount of time and energy to devote to figuring out the world, and that's when I've decided that the return on the investment for me is not very great. Uh, but if one does put energy in trying to understand where to place resources, one has to understand that it's at best a, a sort of band-aid kind of approach that you can have all the socially responsible investing from some small number of people and it will really not change the trajectory of the system. So I don't mind people talking about socially responsible investing as long as they talk about also the possibility of perhaps at some point complementing that strategy with armed revolutionary violence to bring down the capitalist state and deal with the 1% in the way that God intended us to deal with them. <laughs> There's a big debate going on about the divestment campaign that Bill McKibben in 350.org has been leading to get universities, churches, other publicly minded institutions to withdraw from fossil fuel companies. Uh, I, I'm not a great tactician. I'm not terribly good at plotting political strategy. Uh, certainly, its value symbolically is obvious. If you could get the University of Texas at Austin Board of Regents to divest from ExxonMobil, <laughs> sure, that'd be a win. Uh, but like I said, everybody has limited time, energy, and resources. And so the question really isn't, would that be a good thing if it happened? Nobody pretends that it's going to significantly change conditions, but it would be a good thing if it happened. But the question is, is that the place to put your time and your energy and your resources? And here, it, aware of my own limits <laughs> to you know, plot strategy, I tend to be rather eclectic. As long as something doesn't seem overtly counterproductive or destructive, you know, let a hundred flowers bloom or a thousand flowers, I always forget which one it is. Uh, but I also think one shouldn't, you know, put too much stock in these as, as well. It's like the Keystone XL pipeline. Right? Would it be good if the United States refused the permit to complete the Keystone XL pipeline? Sure, and I would support that. But let's not pretend that that's going to be a meaningful intervention that Canada is committed to exploiting the oil sands, the tar sands, probably the most ecologically destructive attempt ever to get hydrocarbons <laughs> to burn, uh, a literally insane project that is possible only because of a confluence of things like cheap natural gas and all sorts of subsidies that come. Right? But if you block the Keystone XL pipeline, we know a lot of that oil is going to end up on railroad cars and there are problems with that, most notably when one of them derailed and caught fire near my hometown <laughs> in North Dakota last year. I mean, you know, it's a, to me, it, it's not a question that one answers definitively, and it's not something you, you attack allies about. You know, I heard a, a, a real role model for me 
intellectually is a guy named Wes Jackson. Wes runs something called the Land Institute in Kansas, and they are pioneering a lot of very exciting sustainable agriculture research there. And Wes was asked this after a talk, you know, well, should we do X or Y or Z, or what about those sons of engineers doing A, B, and C? And Wes said, you know, before we start critiquing everybody else's, you know, strategic decisions, let's just ask a question. Have you joined the fight? You know, are you on board? Have you joined the fight? Have you identified the problem and committed your life to doing something about it in some way? And I think when we ask that question, it tends to make the debates we need to have about strategy uh, a little less intense and a little less destructive. So that's where I come down on that. So to sum up, I didn't explore this much, but uh, part of where this talk's title, Capitalism versus Christianity, A Tale of Two Cults, came from was the news reports about ISIS, ISIL, the Islamic State, whatever you want to call it, and the labeling of the Islamic State as a death cult. And I thought, well, that's interesting. A death cult. <laughs> What's the biggest death cult I've ever identified? One that's far more dangerous than the Islamic State, not to minimize the horror of the tactics and goals of the Islamic State. But I think that's the kind of rhetoric we need. It may seem a little hyperbolic to talk about capitalism as a death cult. But I do think that if we can actually look at the data and tell the truth, it looks like that's where that particular economic system is taking us. So in a sense, what I'm saying is you can look at all of Christianity as a death cult. Christians are a little obsessed with death, in case you haven't noticed, and all those crosses and all that talk about death. So what I'm trying to suggest is we take the crazy death cult that at least has some positive attributes and elevate that and start dealing honestly with the truly crazy death cult of capitalism that is the threat to us all. Thank you. Thanks. Appreciate it.